Hi guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for being here. It means everything to me. Before we get started, I just wanted to say to everybody that has been reaching out to me, showing me support, I appreciate you so much. When I tell you I appreciate you, I truly, truly mean it. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. Please leave me a comment. Please leave me a like. It would mean so much to me. You guys are just the best. And I thank you, thank you, thank you. So before we get started, one more thing. I just wanted to let you know that this case deals heavily with DV. So if that's a trigger for you, then I would not suggest watching this one. And maybe go watch a different one or come back another time. Because your mental health is more important. So I just want to put that out there for you guys first. Jenny Lee McKay was born on June 20th, 1984 in Truro to parents Reverend Douglas and Glenda Campbell. She also had a sister named Allison and a brother named Ben. Jenny was described as a wonderful person with a big laugh, beautiful smile, and huge heart who had a zest for life and a melancholy spirit. She enjoyed writing stories and poetry gardening, singing, playing guitar, painting, sketching, camping, working out, yoga, softball, and cooking. Jenny graduated from Holland College in 2004 with a degree in journalism. She achieved her broker's license and was embarking on a new career path before her death. In 2006, Jenny would meet and fall in love with Jason McKay. Jenny and Jason moved to Regina together in 2007. Jenny's family said they noticed an edginess about Jason, but they didn't judge him for it, as they felt it was pertinent to like your child's partner. The couple married in 2012, and Jenny became the stepmother of Jason's two children from a previous marriage. It is said that there were problems in the marriage for a long time. Both liked to drink and did it quite often. But things started getting very dangerous when Jason McKay started taking antidepressants, sleeping pills, and drinking. Remember I said Jenny graduated with a degree in journalism? So it made great sense that she kept her darkest parts of her marriage inside of a journal. She did confide in friends about how abusive the marriage was and even confided in them that she was planning to leave. She told one of her former colleagues, he hits me a lot, I'm done. Witnesses later came forward to say that they had indeed witnessed Jason hit Jenny. August 27th, 2017, Jenny calls 911 several times. The first call was made in the morning when Jenny told the 911 operator that she wanted Jason removed from the home because he was threatening his teenage daughter. When the police arrived, Jenny did not want to make a formal complaint. She did admit to an officer that she didn't feel safe and she was looking for an exit plan. Jason agreed to go to a neighbor's house, but he returned shortly after, so Jenny called 911 again. She told the operator she was scared her husband was going to hurt her. He's going to break in here. He's going to kill me. Jenny said McKay was drunk and banging on the door to be let in. When the police arrived again, they agreed to take him to his mother's home. While back in the car, he started to threaten the officer and his wife, telling him, I'm not abusive, but I'll effing smack her in the head. He was arrested and spent the night in jail. When McKay went back the next day and climbed in through the window of his home, Jenny called 911 again. He again agreed to go back to his mother's home and complained she would call the cops on him to get him in trouble. Despite the police being called to their home three times in two days, the root of the problem was never really addressed. September 6, 2017, Jason's mom called 911, telling them that she was afraid that her son may be thinking of taking his own life. Police would go to the home again, but this time was much different. They saw Jason first, who was covered in blood, when police asked where Jenny was, Jason told them, she's in the kitchen, I effing killed her. Police walked into the kitchen where they found Jenny on the floor, covered in blood with a knife sticking out of her. Jason stabbed his wife dozens of times with several different knives to the neck and chest. Officers also found pictures on his phone of Jenny's lifeless body. He also admitted to police that he had spent two hours with her body. Further examination would show that Jason continued stabbing Jenny even after her death. There were more than 20 wounds to her body, with the ones to the neck proving to be fatal. While Jason was being arrested, he told officers, quote, I already know I'm charged with murder because she's dead. There's so much blood in there, it's not even funny, end quote. He would even take it one step further and threaten his mother by telling her, you're next. It was a child 
my murder is just beyond that, you know, it's, um, and then the, all the gruesome details, it just, it's just sickening, really, it's just sickening. I visited him in prison when I was here for the prelim, because I wanted to confront him. I had to, I had to hear from him what happened. And he was very, um, showed a real lack of remorse and said a lot of things that were, I just couldn't believe that he would say stuff like that. Like, I can, I think I can beat this. And so that kind of attitude is all his remorse was for himself. And so when he was on the stand, I just didn't really see anything different. Um, I, I can't really describe how, how awful it is to hear that stuff. And then of course at this trial, it's just a whole lot, you hear a whole lot more, You're, there's a lot more detail. There's things, we knew that she was stabbed when she died, but no idea of how gruesome, how vicious. It's something that, you know, as you um, live your life and you raise your family, those kind of things happen to somebody else. You just don't think it's gonna happen to you. And when it does, uh, yeah, it's quite a journey. You know, you look for good in something, right? And, and there is a sense of uh, this affecting people. It's affecting uh, women uh, who may be um, need um, to take a stand in their own relationship and get out. We got to have a wonderful daughter for 33 years, and some people don't get that. In January of 2020, Jason pled not guilty. Since it was a judge-only trial, he would listen to both parts of the evidence and decide Jason's fate. Even though he admitted to what he had done, he pled not guilty, claiming he was too intoxicated to form intent because of the combination of antidepressants and alcohol that he had consumed, saying he had no comprehension of consequences. He would go on to say that after his first sip of wine that night at 8 p.m., he entered into a blackout state then had hallucinations, believing he saw Jenny on top of him, dressed in a black coat with a 20-inch dagger in her hand. The next memory he claims to have is of Jenny on the floor bleeding in her pink shirt. He would go on to claim that he didn't mean to hurt her. It was the voices in his head telling him to do it. Police would refute this claim by saying that Jason didn't seem confused or heavily intoxicated at the crime scene. The prosecution would go on to argue that this was done through malice and anger, with the blackout excuse being nothing more than an attempt at a lighter sentence. Today in court, Justice Michael um, Talker sentenced Jason McKay to life in prison, and McKay can be eligible for parole after serving 17 years. That also includes the time since McKay was arrested in 2017. So back in January, McKay was convicted of second-degree murder for killing his wife, Jenny, who died of several stab wounds. A second-degree murder conviction automatically comes with a life sentence, but today Justice Talker needed to decide how much time McKay must serve before he can be eligible for parole and we found out that is 17 years. Justice Talker says when coming to his decision today he considered three elements McKay's character the nature of the offense and its circumstances. Talker said McKay's previous criminal record which included three convictions of assault causing bodily harm. Jenny's 911 call saying she was scared for her life weeks before she died. The numerous stab wounds she suffered the photos McKay took of Jenny after she died and the victim impact statements all affected his decision.